Uh, this morning I'm presenting on behalf of uh, TopCon, so I do have to uh, declare an interest. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, whether we think refraction um, could become a pre-screening test. Is it just a component of what we do? And I'm speaking to you from, uh, what's happening here? Oh, let's go that way. There we go. I found me. Um, I'm speaking to you from an entirely COVID safe background um, because I just got my vaccination yesterday, as you did with all of our staff. So um, a great NHS uh, piece of work uh, locally for us. Um, it gives us a little bit of reassurance. OK, so um, we're going to think about uh, the, the whole issue of refraction in the context of COVID and social distancing. Um, so let's think about uh, how we go about making decisions in our social distancing. Um, bear in mind, some jurisdictions permit uh, a site testing optician um, to issue a prescription. Now, this is, for example, the, the French model where uh, you would have a subjective uh, refraction, um, but there would be no um, eye examination or, or medical component to that. It's uh, also available out in the Far East where people would prescribe from auto refraction. Um, is this going to happen in the UK? Well, I'm going to illustrate to you why I think it probably won't and why I think it probably shouldn't. Um, but uh, obviously, um, the law is a movable feast. But could we use it to our advantage to enhance our efficiency? in practice and possibly to enhance our social distancing, something that uh, just even a year ago, we wouldn't have even understood the concept of that conversation. So the, there's basically two parts of the presentation. The first of it is, is, is the law, just to bring you up to date with my interpretation of it. It is my interpretation. Um, and secondly, um, the technology that uh, has just uh, just landed. I'm going to take you all the way back to 1911. Okay, so in 1911, um, there were one or two places in the world with registered optometry. Um, the United States, uh, one or two states had got optometry. Um, and I think actually the earliest in the British Commonwealth is actually in Tasmania. Um, but the UK wasn't registered at that time. And this it, it basically was a, was a, a, a Markham was, um, uh, was a was a patient uh, who had uh, suffered visual loss, and he blamed Thomas, uh, who was his optician, for doing that. Every time he went along to see him, he had a new pair of glasses, and he wasn't seeing too well. Ultimately, it was undiagnosed keratoconus. Um, so at the first hearing, which was in 1910, the jury failed to agree on whether that Thomas should have discovered the existence of the conical cornea. Um, bit of a debate on that. Well, I think we can think about what the equipment might have been like at that time. But it was retried under Lord Chief Justice. So this is fairly important stuff. This is, you know, the equivalent of, I suppose, your, your Supreme Court in those days. Um, and Lord Chief Justice uh, instructed the jury that either... Um, uh, Thomas was negligent in his duty as an optician, or he failed to indicate that he was just an ordinary optician and not a specialist. Well, that's a whole different ball game. Um, and uh, Mr. Thomas was fined £25, which was quite a lot of money back in um, 1911. So it was interesting in making the uh, the judgment, the Lord Chief Justice said it was incumbent upon the site testing optician to ascertain whether the case was abnormal or not, and therefore whether it should be referred for medical advice or not. Um, and herein lies the very first obligation to conduct an examination of the eye and potentially to refer. And you should bear in mind that this predates the NHS by something like 37 years. And it predates the registration of optometry. Uh, UK optometry was one of the very, very last of the um, the, the, the English-speaking world to actually register optometry. We're quite late to the game. Um, it was registered at the point where the Opticians Act was passed, which was the 7th of the 7th, 1958. And if anybody knows that date, um, it, it, it's uh, it's actually my uh, the day I was born. Um, so the whole thing is just purely fate. Um, so that was the registration of, uh, of optometry. And it was interestingly as well, it was one of the very few private members bills that actually got through parliament. The uh, provisional indemnity was provided uh, uh, 
from that date by the British Optical Association, which came into being in 1894, uh, funnily enough, on the day that my grandfather was born. Um, and much of the BOA early years was spent in Clifford's Inn, uh, which is just opposite the um, the Z Hotel in Fleet Street. Um, it was bombed out uh, during the Second World War. A lot of records were lost. But during the First World War, interestingly, it was the centre of um, uh, sorting out gas masks and uh, optical lenses um, because the, the BOA volunteered services are a little bit like optometrists are volunteering to vaccinate right now in, in a national emergency. So there was a comment in the press, there usually is, um, and this was um, the press saying the one necessary precaution is to disclaim any concurrent responsibility for the guaranteeing of absence of disease because the optician stands a distinctive remote chance of being ruined by some unhappy combination of circumstances exploited by litigious people. Um, it's interesting to think that that was in 1911. Um, it does beg the question whether things have moved on very much. Uh, and that was the optician which was uh, going at that time. So what is a sight test? Um, it's interesting that one of the best summaries of the regulations in a very simple accessible manner is actually on the Royal College of Ophthalmologists website. It's actually a joint statement by the College of Optometrists and the RCO and it was clearly put there to try to explain to ophthalmologists who would say to people just uh, just go and get your pressures checked or just go and do this or just go and get a sight test. Uh, it was trying to explain to them who live in their in their hospital eye service um, arenas um, that it wasn't quite as simple as that and these were the regulations and the regulations really came about um, sometime after the uh, after the NHS had come into being uh, and it was an interpretation by the then um, chairman of the GOC George Ronald Rougier in 1961 he was also behind um, the referral rules that we worked with up until 2000 um, he basically said, look, there are three steps to a sight test. First of all, you have to ask the question, is there a defect of sight? Um, but it wasn't defined by what defect of sight meant. Um, can you measure it? And once you've measured it, you can issue the prescription. So the three things have to happen. Um, but subsequent regulations added a, a codicil to that. So these are the duties to be performed on site testing. This is straight out of the Opticians Act in 1989. Um, it's a little bit long-winded. It's fairly typical um, legalese, um, but it does explain to you what a registered medical practitioner or registered optometrist has to do if they test the site of another person. So they have to examine the eye for the purpose of detecting injury, disease, or abnormality. They have to give a written statement that he's carried out the examinations that the regulations require and that he is or is not referring. And what the reason for that referral might be, and except where regulations, to the, it should also be his duty to issue a prescription for an optical appliance or a signed written statement that he does not need to use or wear an optical appliance. Um, I do suspect that the, uh, the, the latter part of that is more sinned against by omission um, than commission. Uh, we, generally, um, we generally don't do that. Although uh, in our practice, we do for children. We have a printed statement of no RX which I guess is the box you tick on, on, a, on a GOS 1, but um, we, we don't, uh, we don't tend, as GOS 2, but we don't tend to use those. So that, that brings us into the question of uh, delegated functions. So the testing of site is a reserved or regulated function. It's regulated by the GOC and it's reserved to certain people. Those people are registered medical practitioners and registered optometrists or the above in training. There's nothing to say that you can't have components being done by others, such as dispensing opticians. And in fact, a low vision assessment is not testing site or CLOs where over refraction is not testing site. And presumably clinical assistance as well. I mean, pressing a button on an auto refractor does not really constitute um, testing of site. 
Now, that's all to do with the General Optical Council and the Opticians Act, which overrides both NHS and private. When you have a GOS contract, the regulations are a little bit more subtly different. First of all, to site test under the GOS, you need a contract. You need to be a PHCSE designated performer, which is either a GOC registered optometrist or an ophthalmic medical practitioner who is uh, assigned to the GOS under the BMA ophthalmic committee. It was an interesting thing that when I did my 15 years on the GOC, um, we could never find out anything about this ephemeral BMA ophthalmic committee. Um, generally speaking, they won't um, uh, accept anybody onto that list um, unless they have um, the minimum of the of the part one of the uh, Royal College of Ophthalmologists um, uh, examinations. It used to be called the diploma, um, but it's now the part ones. Um, but interestingly, the majority of ophthalmologists in the UK are not uh, licensed OMPs. They are not able to exercise duties under the GOS. Hospital life service prescriptions are not governed in the same way. So if you have a consultant who is not on the GOS list and is working private, privately, he can only issue a private RX. Um, and it's these regulations that prevent DOs from site testing and Interestingly, and perhaps uh, pejoratively, it excludes them from CET funding. Um, because you're not doing the site testing, it's deemed that you're not able to get CT funding. And that is an anomaly. It's not an anomaly I agree, agree with, but that is the logic of the general ophthalmic services. It's a regulated function. It can only be done by one person or one type of person. So what do you do in a GOS regulation site test? Well, these are the regulations portrayed in 1989. You should have an examination of the external surface of the eye and its immediate vicinity. An intraocular examination either by means of an ophthalmoscope. Uh, and that's interesting because it opened the door to, or left the door open to enable us to do things like bulk lenses and retinal photography potentially. Um, but if you're not going to do ophthalmoscopy, and you're only going to do retinal photography, then you can't charge for that. If you're doing ophthalmoscopy and then you're adding in uh, retinal photography, then that can be deemed an additional service. And then it also says such additional examinations as appear to a doctor or optician to be clinically necessary for the detection of signs of injury, disease, or abnormality. Uh, and therein lies an interesting, uh, an interesting definition because you only need to do those tests clinically necessary for the detection of signs. You don't have to diagnose, you don't have to treat, you don't have to manage, you don't have to differentially diagnose. You're only looking at the detection of signs. And it's that latter aspect that we in our practice and a number of other practitioners use to stop the GOSST at that point. And then we say, well, Obviously, we found something that suggests there's a sign of injury, disease, or abnormality. Uh, we need to investigate that further. And that further investigation might include repeat testing. It might include dilation. It might include other issues um, to make the, uh, the make the diagnosis or start the treatment. Many don't do that. They will just choose to refer after the GOS. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, this is where ophthalmologists do not understand um, that the GOS contract is a very limited um, in terms of scope. Um, and so we get accused of making high false positive referrals, whereas the problem is the contract. Many do examine uh, further. They would dilate somebody, they would bring them back, um, they would do repeat testing, whatever. It would be at their expense. Um, and either it's going to be covered by the cost of the um, spectacles that are dispensed by the rest of the practice to other people um, or it's going to be absorbed within the costs. So let's move on a little bit. That's the background and that, that's that's why uh, this whole area of uh, semi-automating refraction um, does involve um, other individuals within the within the practice team, particularly DOs, CLOs, potentially clinical assistants. Um, and the age-old hoary question that gets asked from time to time, can DOs refract? Well, of course, DOs can refract. The problem is refraction is an act of, of testing. Um, a site test is a legally and statutorily defined item. Um, so 
can DOs test site? No, they can't because it's not permitted under the regulations. Can they refract? Yes, as a component within the site test. So uh, let's move on a little bit before that gets too controversial. Um, let's look at the pre-screening is what a lot of people call it. Um, the Americans might call it lane efficiency. Um, and this is typically the pathway of a patient. They will book an appointment, they get clocked in, um, for us, they would be whisked upstairs to get their optos done, uh, which would be color and uh, fundus autofluorescence. Uh, they would have an eye care tonometry done. And in the days pre-COVID, they would have had a Henson Smart Supra as well. This is before the optometrist sees them. They'd have their glasses measured on a facimeter also. Some practices will introduce an auto refraction at this stage. Um, Sometimes we do, it depends on the, uh, the advanced, uh, advanced knowledge of what the particular patient issue is. So if we're anticipating, for example, something like a potential aberration, um, like a, a keratoconus or something like that, we might get one of those done prior to with an aberometer. Uh, you would then go to the site test with the, uh, with the optometrist into the consulting room, which is typically uh, whatever anterior eye examination you're going to do, your ophthalmoscopy, and your refraction. And this is where the magic is done. The waving on of hands, the asking which is clearer, one or two, or red or green. Um, and if you're a fan of Michael McIntyre, you will have uh, wet yourself laughing at his uh, his uh, jokes about, uh, about the process of sight testing, which is of course, as you understand, completely magical. And you produce an outcome. And that outcome is really only one of four things. You either investigate further, you refer, you dispense, or you discharge, or a combination of those four. And that's basically it. By discharge, I mean discharge to the next routine appointment. Don't forget the final thing is to apply the fee for the examination, whether that's your GOS or your GOS extended or your private fee or whatever it might be. Um, so that's how we've been working in our practice for really quite a long time. And it's pretty familiar to most people. I am going to show you a little video that I think you'll you'll find amusing, um, and uh, we'll we'll just pause here for a moment. I'm sure we've all experienced that. Uh, there is a number six, of course, which is the twister, who twists to the left when you go to look at the left eye, twists to the right when you go to look at the right eye. Um, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, I think that's uh, an optometrist, Dylan, who's, who's produced that, and it has just gone a bit viral, um, but it's very interesting. Okay, so in terms of social distancing, COVID-19 has brought in a whole pile of different aspects. Um, that's actually my daughter uh, sitting there in a much needed break in her role as a paramedic in East London. And if you think you've had the hard time wearing PPE in your practices, uh, that you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, it's controlled our footfall into our practices. We've had reduced footfall. It's re resulted in increased social distancing. So we all went out and sorted out our um, annoying uh, screens on our, um, on our slit lamps. Um, there's been an increased perception of risk of fomite transmission. So fomite transmission is where you have um, a transmission off surfaces. It, there's certainly a big debate about whether that is as bad as uh, everybody thinks, but that's led to excessive cleaning. And for us, that's been our single biggest cost in the practice where we've had equipment fail, electronic equipment fail because of uh, excess moisture. Uh, we've changed the signage on our doors that uh, requires cleaning and ready for use is a little uh, a little slider um, that we slide from one side to the other to tell us what uh, what needs to happen with that room once we've left it. And then one of the key problems we have is residue, residue of debris, of dirt and cleaning materials on things like vault lenses, slit lamp mirrors, uh, ophthalmic lenses for optus, etc. Um, damage I just mentioned. So our aim is generally to stay as far away as possible or to shield it completely if the patient is that vulnerable um, and to minimize the time spent with the patient. 
Uh, oh, that's an interesting one because, of course, there are some practices that work to very tight time schedules with quite heavy, heavy books. Um, there are others that work to a longer time schedule. And I think it's probably fair to say that those who are already working around a 40, 45 minute eye examination time have actually found it easier to adapt to um, to the post-COVID uh, pandemic than, than many of the practices that were relying on high volume. So let's think about autorefraction. Um, old school optometrists like me believe implicitly in retinoscopy. Um, uh, we constantly hear things about how good topographers are at picking up uh, keratoconus or, or how good a pentacam is at picking up keratoconus, et cetera. Uh, that is complete rubbish. Uh, the best way of finding whether you've got an aberrant cornea is a retinoscope in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing. It is a really vital tool, um, and you do have to ask the question whether it is being satisfactorily taught or experienced at the moment. Um, we do prescribe from RET, of course, in special cases, psychopedia, et cetera. Um, but I would ask the question, does anybody in the UK prescribe from autorefraction? Um, you can't check what's going on in the test. It's fully automated. You can't account for binocular influence and you can't account for accommodative change. There's variable interpretation in blur. There's no subjective component, which obviously comes in after your, um, after your, uh, uh, your retinoscopy. And there is an absence of personal interaction and communication. So autorefraction has a role. It's very useful. Uh, however, um, does it really deliver? Uh, you can't preempt error or exercise judgment or intervene as the process is going through. And it underlines fundamentally the need for a subjective, let alone the patient perception of needing a subjective component. So let's introduce the concept of a guided binocular refraction. And it won't come as any great surprise to, to, to hear that uh, Topcon were the, the world leaders in this. So this is a device called the Topcon BV1000. It came out in 2005. Um, it's designed by uh, Yas Yasufumi Fukuma. Uh, Fukuma-san is actually the, um, uh, the man behind, uh, behind our OCTs. And for many of us, um, it's, uh, it, it's ensured that we have a satisfactory uh, pension plan when we come to retire. Um, but it was also a very entrepreneurial uh, optometrist, uh, designer, inventor, very clever guy, Trusset Dave, um, who is known to everybody at eye care because he would be regularly speaking. Um, Trusset Dave and Fukuma-san um, developed the, uh, the BV. It's a binocular autorefractor. You'd recognize it there looking as something a little bit like a synoptophore. It had guided subjective control driven through algorithms, the algorithms that we're all typically uh, 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 used to in terms of one or two, et cetera. Um, they demonstrated scientific proof of concept and it was ahead of its time. Um, if you want to write it, if you want to read a write up of it, you can find it in the optician going back uh, in the archive. Um, and it was also published uh, scientific research as well. But uh, it was probably ahead of its time. It didn't take off. It had a high degree of expense and it probably landed just about the point when people were talking about um, other elements of deregulation and, and perhaps wasn't the right thing to do. Now, having said that, we've been strong advocates of automated for opters uh, for a very long time. And uh, I think the sales of automated for opters of different manufacturers has pretty much gone through the roof because they're so much easier to manage in the pandemic. Um, so we happen to use the CV5000. It's socially distant. You can sit back from the patient. You have single dial logic. You can import from the lens meter. Um, you have different ways of controlling this. Um, and you have integrated charts that you can use. The specification is uh, listed below. But the most important thing is remote control from anywhere by driving that Feropter algorithm um, over the web has been a reality for some time. Um, you might sit back in your room and, and do it with an iPad, um, but you could equally sit in another room um, or you could equally sit at home um, and have the optometrist at home and somebody sitting in the in the practice with this in, um, in front of the patient's eyes. Um, an interesting concept. And this just gives you a, a, an overall schematic of how you might integrate de various different components in the system um, with the CV5000, where you have your controller, whether it's by tablet, mouse and monitor. It could be integrated in with Thomson charts, etc. So it's a bit of a sales pitch there, I guess. <clears throat> there is competition. 
Uh, so we have a, a, a device called the Vision RTM 800 by Essilor Instruments. Um, you may have seen this uh, being uh, being utilized in different um, uh, different exhibitions. Um, this uses a very, very novel concept of a liquid lens. Um, so there are no rotating um, uh, lenses on the Geneva gear system that the Eldridge Green Refractor um, uh, originally developed. So these are, are a unique way of achieving this. Totally different philosophy. It's very much more geared around the subjective experience. Uh, it can refract down to 0 0.05 uh, steps. Really? Uh, you really want to do that? Um, we only have one or two um, physics teachers and engineers who come to us asking if they can be tested to uh, 0.12 of, of adapter. Um, and we usually uh, give them 20 pounds and suggest they go up the road. Um, they, they, they're often more trouble than they're worth. Um, so the idea is it's, uh, it's easier for the practitioner <coughs> uh, because it has a series of smart tests and algorithms. And then you can give somebody a virtual experience um, and, and sort of immerse them in a customized real world. The philosophy is really different because there's no there's no original automation in this for the, your your initial refraction. Um, the eye refract Luno Visionics is uh, is a combined uh, dual auto refractor. It has two aberrometers, two Shack Hapman sensors. Um, and it, it's basically using uh, utilizing binocular refraction in real time. Um, anticipating the concept of delegated functions and being able to intervene subjectively, uh, running it off something similar to an iPad. It is a close cousin to the Topcon Kronos. Now, let's just go back to summarizing where we are. In an average examination room, you have a chart working distance that could be as low as three meters, but maybe out to six with or without mirror. Uh, you have a refraction system with chair and stands. So it's fairly chunky, large furniture. Um, you have conventional subjective needs space, it needs time, and it needs qualified staff. And these are your typical instruments. So why don't we add all those together into one instrument, and that is the Topcon Kronos. So in guided binocular refraction here, you can see the person sitting there. Um, it, it's adjustable for height, so it's perfectly feasible to use it for somebody who is uh, wheelchair bound. The footprint is uh, no bigger than a square meter. It goes up against the wall. Um, so there is no um, distance chart as such. You are using the distance vergence of the instrument. Um, but you've got two auto refractors built in. You've got a built in chart system. You've got subjective control. How does it work? Well, it works like a delegated function in potentially in the pre optometrist cycle. So it could be done by a CA or a DO. And our experience in our practice um, is that either has become perfectly capable of, uh, of doing that. Um, it does need a little bit of tweaking with the algorithm and you have a certain degree of control of the cycle. Even Ken and Barbie could actually work this instrument. Um, it's worked through a, an algorithm called SightPilot, which is a web version of the CV5000 algorithms. Um, and it's very similar to what you'd recognize, one or two, red or green. Um, obviously, there are still things to learn. There are software upgrades coming through on a regular basis. But once completed, the results are passed to the optometrist. Now, the, the, there is conceivably difficulty. Uh, for example, the patient is um, stalling a little bit. They're, um, they're not very sure whether it's, <coughs> whether it's one or two. Um, maybe the sequencing of questions has, uh, has confused the patient. And under those circumstances, the optometrist can jump on this. So the optometrist could be in another room, could be in another country, um, but can basically jump onto the site pilot from outside the system um, and resolve that issue. And that might be what you would want to do, for example, for somebody who was um, uh, a myope, you wanted to make sure that uh, you were not um, having a certain amount of proximal accommodation that was going to be dragging the uh, um, dragging the accommodation in and altering the prescription. So I'm just going to play a little video. Um, there's the, there was some music. You can't hear the sound, so there's, there's no there's no commentary on this. It's just the video. So you also have keratometry built in. It's automatically aligned, and that's on the horizontal and the vertical, monocular.
So you achieve an auto refraction, keratometry, ferropter, and acuity. Using the sight pilot to guide you. Very much smaller. Obviously, you can delegate. we could be completely reinventing refraction here. So just revising that, we have the distance target. Um, and there, there is a, a, from the top of the machine, uh, there is a drop down that helps position the cheek. So if you've got somebody that is tilting into it, you can adjust it to the correct position and the, the little contact, uh, contact things rest on the cheek. Um, it works to an assumed vertex distance of 1375, so it positions itself to get to that. So um, going outside the realms of plus or minus four and needing a, a corrected vertex distance is not um, is not a problem. Um, it is a problem for a lot of optometrists because we still see prescriptions that come to our practice with no vertex distance on them. Um, a little bit of a nuisance, but there you go. Um, you have uh, automated for Opta, you have an automated 3D alignment. You have vision testing charts within there that are run on a logmar system. So this is the typical operation. So as you align it and you're looking at your iPad, um, you can see the auto refraction taking place in, in each eye. Um, it's positioning the patient. It's setting that up. It conducts that examination and then takes you straight into a duochrome with um, a Humphreys fogging on the other eye. Um, you basically say, are you red? Are you green? You press the button, you wait till you get to equality, and then you move to the cross cylinder. Um, and everybody here uh, as an optometrist would recognize you. You're doing one or two, one or two. Um, and uh, once you've pressed your buttons um, and you've done both axis and cylinder, um, you then move over to the visual acuity chart. Um, and for example, if the patient reads T, you push your finger on the letter T and Z and V and F. Um, and when you get to the end, you are done and it produces a result. OK, and this is very typical of the results that we've been finding. Um, and the big question you're going to ask, and it'll come up in a moment, is would we prescribe from it? And the simple answer is um, yes, we do. However, it's not suitable for monocular patients, so it doesn't work for me. It throws a bit of a wobbler because of my uh, prosthetic eye. Um, amblyopia will cause it problems, particularly if there's more than a two-line difference between the two eyes. Somebody with significant low vision, it doesn't go down below 6 over uh, 120 as a visual acuity, but even at that point, it's going to struggle to get a satisfactory subjective. <coughs> significant cataract, and if you've already dilated the patients, they would be a problem. So it very much fits in with what you might understand as the passing rule. 80% of the patient base is probably suitable to be put on this instrument. And of those 80%, 80% of them will give us completely accurate results. Would I prescribe from it? Yes, unequivocally we have. Um, it, it is quite remarkable how good, particularly um, cylinder axis and power. Um, there is always the risk of needing modification to the spheres and that's where your experience comes in you know you leave your myops a little bit on the red you need your hyperopes a little bit on the green um, and of course you can always do a trial frame check if you're suspecting proximal accommodation and you can also do a trial frame check if the working distance is an issue but we generally would work out the near vision working distance first program that in because of course it comes out with a near ad as well the point I would make here is that we should not get hung up on refraction being either rocket science or some sort of magic process that absolutely can only reside within uh, one profession. I can't, in all honesty, argue for an enhanced role in therapeutics if I deny um, my DO colleagues um, an increased scope of practice to be able to allow them to develop. Um, and we have done that in our practice. Um, we have. DOs that have their own fee earning um, fee earning examinations in consulting rooms, um, for example, undertaking low vision contact lenses, etc. And this just seems an entirely logical perspective. But as I've pointed out before, there is an unavoidable common law link with eye health that goes back over a hundred years. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's only one jurisdiction in uh, the English speaking world that has changed that, made that, broken that link, uh, and that's British Columbia. 
um, and there are some very dubious reasons as to why that happened. I really don't see that beginning to happen, but at the end of the day, we are a team. Some refractive net changes are definitely clinical and medical and require investigation. So sudden myopic shifts, for example, that could indicate fluid retention in the lens, et cetera. So the big question is what's in it for me? Well, space, okay? It, it really doesn't take up very much space at all. You just need it up against a wall, a bit like the OCT Maestro that takes up a very small footprint. It is conceivably efficient for those patients that you can get through the system, um, leaving you a little bit more time for those that are a little bit more difficult. So site pilot is, is, is exactly what most optometrists would recognize. Um, the data you get is your objective refraction, your subjective, your keratometry. And then the other issue here is the return on investment. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment. So in terms of financial models, we'll have a look at a little bit of a spreadsheet and we'll see what it might change for you. We'll make some assumptions on salaries and time and assumptions on whether you're using an employed or self-employed optometrist. I think it could well be a sea change in optometry. And if you look at the crucial developments that have occurred over the years, Helmholtz ophthalmoscopy over 150 years ago, Goldstrand slit lamp probably 100 years ago, the green refractor, the first for opters using the um, Geneva gear system coming out of New York in the, in the 1900s, the gold metonometer in the 50s, octopus automated perimetry in the 70s, bulk fundus lenses in the 80s, electronic patient records and electronic linking of databases. Do not underestimate how important that is. Um, OCTs and now Kronos, a complete game changer. So what I'm going to do is change from that and go to a spreadsheet. And what we're going to say is, uh, let's say for sake of argument, well, it's a fairly low locum rate, might be a post-COVID locum rate. Prior to COVID, we might have been something like 275. Um, and we had something like um, uh, two locum days a week. Um, and the number of total test days we've got in the week, something of the order of, uh, let's say, um, uh, we're going to test six days in the week, okay? Uh, my site test fee, are you watching the red number on the bottom right has gone from a minus figure? Let's say your site test fee is £32. Um, and uh, how many additional site tests do you think you might do a day? Well, maybe with this system, um, if you've got one clinical assistant doing Optos and eye care in one room, one clinical assistant doing uh, Kronos in another room, and then you're the optometrist receiving that data, seeing the patient for your for your slit lamp and possibly your 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 bulk lens, etc. Um, let's say you can see an average of another two patients a day. Oh, that number has suddenly shot right up. It's changed your profit, um, and that is allowing for. If you look across to the right here, that is allowing for the actual cost of the machine. Kronos is not something that you purchase. It's something that you rent. Um, the big advantage of rental is that uh, you don't own it, which means that it's the responsibility of the provider to sort out your warranty and your servicing. So those uh, situations where you've bought an OCT, had your warranty, your warranty's run out, you've not bought a maintenance program, it's mission critical to carrying on your work and then all of a sudden you find that the machine isn't functioning for you you need to call an engineer out the call out charges are obviously quite expensive so this gives you a kind of idea of of where you might be in terms of income um, perhaps what we'll do is we'll say there aren't any locum uh, optometrists in the practice um, and so we're still going to be doing an extra uh, two patients a day um, the optometrist salary is um, let's say 42,000, um, by the time they've added um, national insurance, you're looking at, at a non-cost of 47. Uh, but look what's happened to the annual gross profit just by getting those extra two patients in a day. Um, in terms of capacity increase, 12.9, and in terms of um, time saving, something of the region of two hours. Um, so the potential here is to improve the efficiency and enable the optometrist to uh, run off and do some other things, uh, which are becoming increasingly vital. Um, so Stuart, I'm happy to take questions uh, if you're comfortable with that. That's my run through of the TopCon Chronos.